you very much, Kamalesh. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining this uh, session on Protect Your Crown Jewels with Conditional Access. Uh, my name is Ed Baker. I'm an MCT Regional Lead for the UK and an MVP in Enterprise Mobility. Uh, if you want me on Twitter, it's at Ed Baker 1965. Don't forget, uh, when we're allowed to travel again, I'm in the UK and certainly can't travel at the moment, but when we're allowed to travel again, next March is the Microsoft 365 Collaboration Conference in Las Vegas. And a big thank you to all the sponsors that have made this possible. This 36 hour absolute marathon of 400 sessions. Uh, our platinum, gold and silver sponsors all there. Thank you very much to them. Slide for the raffle. And just a notice here that 10% of everything coming from the sponsors is going to support community relief in these current times. Um, and uh, it will be well applied, I'm sure. That's me. Today we're going to talk about Azure Active Directory conditional access, uh, keeping all our enterprise data safe and protecting our crown jewels. The agenda for this uh, 50 minute session is talk about the current threat, to our identities and our data. Look at our platform protection. So the Azure Active Directory protection we have, not just conditional access, but the basic protection we have and how we get our identities from on-premises into Azure as well. So some fundamental security background to Azure Active Directory. I'm finishing off with conditional access and a demonstration of some of the features of conditional access. It's no surprise to anybody that in the current times, security is paramount. Data is being stolen, people are being hacked, individuals, large corporations, large businesses are going out of business because they are not protecting their data, their identities, and their security of their cloud environment. The cloud is inherently secure, provided you take advantage of all of the security measures that are openly available to everybody. Um, the next few slides come from the Ignite session on conditional access. So all the stats are Microsoft published stats. Uh, we spend probably 60% or more of our time on the PC, on the web, browsing the internet, accessing cloud applications, doing all those things that lead us to uh, put at risk potentially our data and our corporate identity as well. The cost of a breach, some could say is unmeasurable or immeasurable. Uh, it's not only financial, your reputation as a business goes down, you can lose your entire livelihood through one small breach. You certainly will lose customers and business. Some stats there that the average cost of a data breach to a company, three and a half million dollars. Microsoft spend a lot of money on their protecting their edge, over a billion dollars, cybersecurity protecting their edge. And part of that is in tracing and tracking leaked identities and other uh, dark web secrets. 730,000 and more, these are all as of last November, so they're only going to have grown, compromised accounts due to password spray in four months. So our passwords are things we really want to uh, look after or even better, completely do away with. First step is enabling multi-factor authentication. Reduction in account compromise, almost well, over two thirds. We're now in a world of mobility. We're no longer in the good old pre-COVID-19 pre-mobility days. In the old days, you had a Windows Server Active Directory, you had your users, devices, apps and data protected by your physical boundaries and protected by your uh, virtual and security boundaries with firewalls and proxies and all the things you would have to protect your environment. The picture today is more like this. So rather than having your control plane in your network and controlling things there, we now have to use identity as the control plane for all of our security, whether it be internal or external. 
which gives us a number of security goals. The security goals we have ideally for a hybrid solution is to use a single identity for on-premises and our cloud resources, which lets our, cust and lets our customers use their own credentials to access our online resources, not force them to have new accounts. To let people change their passwords wherever they are, however they want to. So self-service password reset, reducing help desk requirements. Stop people from using well-known, plainly silly compromised passwords. And then we want to be able to analyze how risky a sign-on or an individual is and protect per sign-in or per user, rather than a blanket approach to everybody. The idea is to give our users as much flexibility or as much productivity as we can by using our tools flexibly. And a blanket MFA across all of our users, regardless wherever they are, isn't necessarily the best or the right way to do it. Does a user really need to use multi-factor authentication every time they sign in, all day, every day, when they're wired into their work machine? So multi-factor authentication, obviously more than one factor. Our username and our pers password is something we know, something we have could be our smart card or our authenticator app, and something we are could be Windows Hello, biometrics, facial or fingerprint. Once you've authenticated correctly, we can give authorization to the apps and resources and more importantly, the data sitting either on premises or in the cloud that we're protecting quite strongly. And then we can give varying access levels depending on um, lots of conditions and lots of reasons for why people want it and where they're accessing it from. So we have three very simple access goals. We want to simplify all users access to devices and applications. We want to safeguard everybody's credentials. We don't want them effectively using passwords and if they do, we want them to be ultra secure and their sign-ins to be ultra secure. We also want to make the protection at the time you try and sign in. So as soon as the access is made, protect at that point, not lock everything up before we get to that point. And Azure Active Directory, gives us a number of solutions to do that. So it's Microsoft's cloud-based identity solution. It's not actually an Active Directory. It's a flat file solution, but it's a scalable, global, multi-tenant solution that allows effectively federation between organizations, which Microsoft uh, arranges for you and produces very simply through an invite and acceptance scheme. Every Active Directory, uh, also the, the Azure Active Directory has an AAD tenant every time you sign up for any Microsoft online service. So Microsoft 365, Azure, Intune, Dynamics 365, all of those come when you sign up, you get a tenant, preferably the same tenant, otherwise you have issues. You can connect your custom domains to your Azure Active Directory. Originally, you get an on Microsoft.com domain, which cannot be changed once you've created it, but you can then verify your own domains and connect it. So you can use the same identity. You can use the same on premises domain in the cloud. Azure AD, AD gives us a plethora of absolutely critically powerful administrative roles. It gives some less powerful, picked out here a few of them, if essentially saying, uh, from the crown jewels and absolutely everything, the global administrator can control everything, all the way down to help desk administrator who can do very little, but he can change people's passwords. And if you lose credentials or people are compromised with those roles, we have a number of issues. So our identity services to manage these, we've got the on-premises domain controllers or domain, which uses domain controllers and an LDAP directory. It's hierarchical, it's been here forever, and it's nice and secure for on-premises and we use Kerberos and we use NTLM to authenticate into that. And we have our Azure Active Directory. There are no domain controllers. There's no replication between cloud regions. It's all across the entire infrastructure. It's flat, there are no OUs, there are no group policies. There is a, a, a service called Azure Active Directory Domain Services, which is a highly available, scalable system that allows you to effectively fire up domain controllers managed by your Azure Active Directory. So it's a managed domain, 
which allows you to have VMs in Azure signing in with Azure AD and also joining the domain for the Windows VMs. So we have those two. We need to put our identities across both. So people in Active Directory need to be visible in Azure Active Directory so they can sign in. And we have our Azure Active Directory Connect tool for that. With synchronization, it provides password right back. It provides um, hybrid solutions for exchange. It provides seamless single sign on for on premises environments. And we can do all of that by connecting those two together. No VPN is required and we only need a 443 outbound connection. The default is a password hash sync, which gives us a, a, an excellent um, on in the cloud authentication model. If you want to authenticate on premises, you can use pass through, authentic or pass through authentication, deploy some agents on premises and manage your authentication that way. Not complex, free. It's an absolutely free service that. So far, I've not described anything that's going to cost you any money at all. Azure Active Directory is free. Azure Active Directory Connect is free and pass through authentication is free. Some of the services, some of the right backs and some of the other services do require the premium license, which you get with the E3 and E5 SKUs of Microsoft 365. Seamless single sign on allows a user on premises to sign in to his on premises environment with his on premises ID and he is also then automatically signed in to his cloud services as well and doesn't have to enter passwords and usernames in his web services. There's also the Microsoft account. So the Microsoft account is one of Microsoft's identity services for consumers mostly that allows them to take advantage of some of the features in Azure Active Directory. And I mentioned that we want our customers to be able to connect to our, our resources and our data without entering new sets of credentials. And we can use Azure Active Directory business to business for that. So we invite a user as a guest to come and work with us. When they accept the request, Azure Active Directory federates between the two. When they sign into our domain or our tenant with their credentials from their tenant or their other identity provider, they are automatically given the permissions we give them. The Azure Active Directory business to consumer is a separate Active Directory or a separate directory that you create for your applications. So if I publish an application, I want users to use it. I don't want them in my business application directory, but I do want a directory to manage their accounts. I can use that and they can use their own third party identity providers, Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, those sort of things. And all of these are able to take advantage of our self-service password reset. Remove the help desk from most of your pain and suffering of people forgetting and, re and renaming passwords. So you do it from the web and if you've got password write back enabled for on premises, it will write back your on premises identities password into your Active Directory. Now, Microsoft, I mentioned, spend a billion dollars or more at the edge every year to protect their environments, and they do all of this. They have this trillions and trillions of authentications, application usage across their cloud systems, and it picks up all of the risk events, all of the signals, and it then measures them and puts um, machine learning and artificial intelligence against those to produce this continuous detection of things that could be going or could be insecure when people try and sign in into your environment. And you can then from that produce alerts, produce the uh, policies that will prevent people from getting in when the risk is high and automatically change those risks with other tools. One of the tools, we're almost at conditional access, one of the tools that's built in is Smart Lockout which is an awesome bit of kit. Bad people out, good people in. User tries to sign in from Redmond in Washington, his normal location. If he signs in with um, the correct password, his familiar location counter stays the same. When he fails, it goes up one. When he fails, it goes up another one. When he logs back in again, it goes back down to zero and he's in. If a bad actor, say from another location, 
totally unfamiliar to Azure Active Directory for you. It knows when you sign in, it knows where you sign in from. So this is not only a new location, but it'll be a new ISP, a new IP address, totally new environment. It treats him as an unknown location. When he tries to sign in, the counter goes up and up and up, and eventually he gets locked out. At the same time, you as the in the familiar location can still sign in because you're in your familiar location and you're not locked out. So it's a smart lockout. But that relies on our passwords and our credentials being entered. We really have some challenges with our passwords. So people use common passwords regularly, they reuse them. There are password spray attacks which are on the rise, so they're being cracked and hacked. An active directory can't natively on its own ban common passwords. But when you've got Azure Active Directory Connect enabled, you can protect both using smart lockout and using a, the um, standard banned passwords list for Microsoft and the custom banned list. So you can add in new identities and new or new password identities which you don't want to be used. And you can even enable this on Windows Server Active Directory as well. But passwords in general, um, password reuse is on the rise. They're a weak link. Breaches are very expensive and they generate loads of support calls. So Microsoft have come across the new tools, the passwordless offerings. So you've got Windows Hello for Business. So it'll do fingerprint or facial ID or PIN, which locks it up in the TPM. You've got the authenticator, which allows you to not use a password as well. And then there's the new FIDO2 keys, so YubiKey, other manufacturers are available, which means you don't have to enter your password either. So if you're not sending your password, nobody's going to learn your password, therefore your credential is safe. So we've hit most of these so far. But we want to look at this analyze sign-on risk, protect and respond to suspicious sign-on activity. And that's where Azure Active Directory conditional access comes in. So Azure Active Directory, both using um, the devices from almost any platform, so Android, iOS, Mac OS, Windows. You can call them trusted, you can call them compliant. If you're using um, Intune, you can put have compliance policies, which reduces the risk if it's a trusted device and if it's a compliant device. Compliant could mean it's got Encryption, you can set lots and lots of different policies for compliance. You can choose where people sign in from and when you let them, whether they're on corporate network or elsewhere in the world. You can allow them to sign into browser apps, client apps or cloud apps. So it controls your applications, your location, both physical and virtual, your devices and the identities either through Azure Active Directory, ADFS, Microsoft accounts or your Google IDs. You can control all of these for customers, partners and yourselves. And with a mixture of the evaluation engine, the policies you create for conditional access and the machine learning on 40 terabytes worth of data, Microsoft will come out with a risk factor of your session, low, medium or high. You can then choose fundamentally to allow or block. You can allow or block access to your resources. You can provide limited access. You can force them to use MFA for this particular sign in. So as an example, if somebody goes to a foreign country you don't normally see people in, you can set up locations that say if anybody signs in from here, I want to require MFA because I want to make sure I know who they are because that's not a usual place for us to sign in. If the sign in risk is particularly high, I can also force password. The user risk is particularly high. I can force password reset. I can also completely block any legacy non-modern authentication. And from that, I can control access to all of Microsoft's resources. So Microsoft 365 and Azure, all the cloud and SaaS apps. So Microsoft has integrated. There's more than three and a half thousand there now, and you can integrate your own apps in that as well and also to on-premises and web apps as well. So I can control all the signals going in or I can read all the signals going in, evaluate them and control who gets in to do what and when. 
So to configure our conditional access, we want to protect our corporate resources, making decisions about who accesses based on our device and identity signals. So effectively, conditional access has three stages. It has the signals that are being received by the user and the sign-in, or from the user and the sign-in. It has the decisions you make based on your policy, and then it enforces those decisions. This helps your users become far more productive wherever and whenever they are, protects your assets, and you can apply the right access controls when you need without having to blanket approach with multi-factor authentication across everything all the time. You don't get in your user's way when you don't need to. So the signals take up your device signals. So is it trusted? Is it compliant? Your user and location, is it the right person? Are they in the right place? What applications we're talking about? and whether there's any real-time risk from Microsoft's machine learning, so user risk or sign-in risk. You can then block, allow, require MFA, dead simple, and then they get access to the data. What can I control? So the common signals I can control here, so I can target policies at users or groups, which means administrators have got very fine-grained control over who gets what access to what. I can provide IP location information, so I can create lots of trusted or named or known IP address ranges and even countries that don't that I don't have to identify the IP ranges for that, which will help me make policy decisions on who should get in and who shouldn't. The device, obviously I've mentioned users with devices, specific platforms can be marked for a specific type of conditional access policy, so I can target a policy at a specific platform, or I can target this policy at a group of platforms. It doesn't really matter. And then I can target at certain applications. So if I have a key application that I want protected more than others, I can have a separate conditional access policy protecting that application. Microsoft Cloud App Security also provides us with a number of signals, and it also allows us to produce access and or user access to sessions in a web application, which is controlled in real time, which means I, if they're coming from outside my environment, they may only get certain access on that web app, but not able to print anything or not able to do other things. I can do session control as well. The decisions I make, very simple, I can block or I can grant. So even though, as you can see here, the sign in was successful, but you've just not met the criteria to access the resource, you're not coming in. And if I grant access, I can require a lot of things. I can require multi-factor authentication or a compliant device or a hybrid Azure join device, so one that's joined to both Azure AD and a domain. I can say it must be approved client apps or I can have an app protection policy from Intune to manage and I can also grant access if terms and conditions have been signed. So if you've got a guest user coming in with conditional access for the first time, you might require them to acknowledge your terms and conditions. This isn't an enrolled device, so they haven't acknowledged those conditions when they enrolled it. You want them to comply with your policies, you can make them do that. Now, in conditional access at the moment, there are a number of uh, retired policies. These baseline policies have now been retired as of February, I think it was, and you can now recreate them in your own policies if you want to. So those are a number of policies that were created automatically and applied if you wanted them. But you can then go and create policies for granting or blocking access from certain locations, blocking certain risky sign-ins, or requiring devices that are managed by the organization, so mobile device management, Intune management for specific applications only. They're applied in two stages. The first phase, all policies are evaluated, so not just one policy, every policy applying to that sign-in. All access controls that aren't satisfied are then collected up. In the second phase, you're prompted to satisfy those. So if you have an MFA, you must MFA. 
If you're on the wrong device, you're not going to get in. If any one of the policies blocks access on the conditions you have, you will not be allowed in. You're not even prompted to satisfy any of the other controls. If none of the policies block you at all, you're let in as long as you satisfy all the controls that are enabled for that. Your assignment, so you create a policy and you assign the policy to a user or a group and they are anded. So if you've got more than one assignment configured, all assignments have to be satisfied. It's not like access control lists where if you hit something that applies, you're not in or you're in. Every single policy has to be anded and all of the conditions are anded. If you are there and you've met all the conditions, you can then come in. If you want to configure a location condition that applies to every single connection from outside your network, you could include all locations, but exclude trusted IPs. So there's a trusted, when we create the policy, you'll see everywhere there's an include, there's an exclude as well. And in fact, best practice is for every single conditional access policy, make sure one of your uh, global admins that's locked away, your break glass accounts is excluded. So that if anything goes wrong, they can always sign in without MFA, allow another global admin in, and then seal that policy up again. So we're going to go into a demonstration now. We've got ooh, plenty of time for demonstration. So we're going to look at named locations, create a couple of named locations. We're going to create an allow policy, create a block policy, uh, show you terms of use, and then see it in action. So here is my Azure Active Directory for my demo environment. We work for hybriddemo.cloud. And you can see I've accessed the Azure AD portal. I could have gone to the main portal. Uh, I could potentially have gone to the new device management or endpoint portal, but I'm going to do it from the Azure Active Directory portal. And you can see Azure Active Directory conditional access is, enable, is able to be accessed directly, but it's located under Azure Active Directory, under security, with MFA, it's enabled here. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is look at named locations. Now, with multi-factor authentication, you can create locations called trusted IPs, and you can use those in your conditional access policy. This is not the same. So here you can see configure MFA trusted IPs. That's entirely different. This is locations, not trusted IPs. So I'm going to go and create a new location. And I'm going to choose it on countries. And I'm now going to select uh, China. I'm going to select Russia. And I'm going to select Korea. Now I know that none of my employees will ever go to those places where they're going to work. So I can make that a block policy. So I can then say, I also don't want people getting in with anonymous VPNs or areas I don't know where they are. So I'm going to do include unknown areas and create that location. So I now have a location I can use. I can create locations that are trusted. So here you've got my home location and my temporary office that are trusted locations. That's again different to trusted IPs. So I have there my locations. If I go into conditional access, make this fractionally bigger for you. Make sure there's nobody saying they can't see anything. No, nope, can't see the Q&A page. OK, so I have these baseline policies. These baseline policies died in February. You can see them, but you can't use them. And I've created a number of policies here. I've also created a brand new terms and conditions document that people must apply or accept when they want to access my systems. So I'm going to go into new policy. And I'm going to create a new policy called band locations. And I'm going to pick um, 
or guests and external users. So it's just for guests and external users. I'm not going to exclude anybody because I haven't added everybody. If I had picked all users, I should go into exclude and pick either my global administrators or an individual user here that is a global administrator or has admin privileges at the, over this system at the very least. So I've included my all guest and external users. I'm going to choose all cloud apps. And my conditions are. I'm not interested in sign in risk. I'm not interested in what platform they're on. I'm solely interested in location. So I'm going to configure location and I'm going to choose my selected location, which is. I called it band. Oh, well, we'll pick this location, disallowed locations. I may not have actually created that last one. So that is now selected. I can then choose what client apps it applies to. It applies to my browsers and all my other applications. So anybody coming from those three locations on any application in my environment, on any device of any state, of any sign in risk, is now going to be blocked. If I did want to let them in, I could grant access, but make sure they have one or all of these selected controls. So I could say require all of the selected controls. I'm going to have uh, hybrid demo terms. It must have an app protection policy. It must have a, a approved client. It must be marked as compliant and it must be. And then they'd have to do all of that. As it happens, no, I don't care. They're not coming in. I don't need session controls here. Now, by default, it only does report only, but I'm going to switch this on and create. So anybody from those disallowed locations is now in my banned locations policy. So anybody signing in just will not get in. Now an allow policy, go and create a new allow policy. So CA test to demo. I'm going to pick one user as a demo. And I'm going to pick all apps and conditions. I'm not going to consider con configure sign in risk, but there is a document somewhere that explains what each one of these means to Microsoft. So what level of risk is applied based on conditions? So if I went to my identity protection section, which I'll show you in a while, which is a P2 feature, I'm able to see what risky sign ins have happened in my environment. Uh, device platforms. It's going to be Windows 10. Location, I'm not configuring. I don't care where they are. Client apps, configure all of them. Device state, not configured. And I then go to grant. And I'm going to say allow access, require multi-factor authentication. And I must see some terms, please. And I want both of those. Click select. And I'm going to switch that on. Now, I also have, and you'll see the slide right at the end, a what if. So I can now say, pick my user. And I can select locations, platforms, apps, whatever, sign in risk and ask what if. And it will say there are three policies for what for what if in this situation. One is on the one I've just created. The other two are in report only mode. And one requires multi-factor authentication and acceptable use policy terms. One requires multi-factor authentication, device compliance and terms. And the other requires multi-factor authentication and hybrid terms. So I've got a what if solution to work out what's going on as well. So let's have a look at this user. I've got CA test two and I want to sign in as that user. So I'm now going to go into office.com and sign in as CA test two. So I'm going to enter my password. Oh, 
it's not done that again, has it? OK, I know why that's happened. Bear with me. Uh, 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 uh. That's using the wrong policy, so I'm going to uh, take that policy off. And before I do that, I'm going to go in and I'm going to go and create uh, a new terms of use. Because what I've done is require that terms of use to be registered on every device, which means I have to register that device and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to put new terms. Uh, display name, new terms. I'm going to upload my document. And my terms are in F terms, upload my terms, choose English. Just a PDF document, English United Kingdom. Uh, I'm going to make them open the terms and read them. I don't want consent on every device. I'm not going to expire it. Uh, and I'm going to create an conditional access policy later. Click create. So that's now created a new set of terms. If I go back to my CA policies and I pick this new one, and I go down to my controls. Let's go and create a new one. It hasn't refreshed that yet. I'll take those terms off for now because it's causing it problems. OK, select and on. Just check those terms out, demo terms, to make sure they don't have that set. Good, that's off, so I can save that now. OK, so now we can go back and do a quick. What if for CA test two? And run it and see what what will happen. I've only got one policy, it's that one, and those terms don't require me to open them, so it should all work beautifully this time, otherwise it's a failed demo. I hate failed demos. So I will enter password. There we go. So it's making me MFA immediately. It's just sent me a text. Please let it have sent me a text. Yes, it sent me a text. So I can now do my MFA on here. In this account, I use a text code. So 660-709. So that's the first one. Stay signed in. And I took the terms off, so it hasn't made me do the terms, but it's made me do the MFA immediately. So prior to that, I wouldn't have had MFA. So if I now sign out as this user. And I remove. Come on. And I remove the. Policy. Report only and save. When I sign in again. It should not make me. MFA. <laughs> Hasn't picked it up yet. Let me go back to that, make sure it has applied it. Do a what if. Report only, report only, report only. OK, we shouldn't have an MFA now. Let's try once more. Office.com. Sign out as that person. And sign in the last time. Failed demo. Apologies for that. I don't know why that's doing that. It hasn't updated yet, so it's still doing an MFA when it shouldn't do an MFA, for which I have no idea why that's happening. OK. So we've done terms of use, we've done conditional access policy block, conditional access policy allow. The other tools I want to show you in here 
Uh, I showed you the what if tool. And I showed you, um, I'll show you the diagnosis tool in a second, but uh, some top tips. So if you have a policy that blocks, that uses all users and all cloud apps and it blocks access, or it requires a compliant device, or it requires domain join, or it requires a policy. So any policy that is all users and all apps, or all cloud, all users, all cloud apps, all devices that blocks access, just stop. Don't do it. Always, always add an excluded user with admin privileges. Otherwise, you will lock yourself out of the portal. You'll lock yourself out of absolutely everything. The other tool, just before we finish, uh, did the last demo in a minute, but just before we finish, the other tool uh, that comes with Microsoft 365 or Enterprise Mobility Suite or Enterprise Mobility and Security, I should say, E5, is Microsoft Cloud App Security. It integrates into conditional access. It allows you to uh, remediate, quarantine things, prevents you to uh, move files that aren't supposed to be moved in a particular place, protects all things on downloads. So your conditional access with Cloud App Security would stop you downloading something from a web app if you're in the wrong location or prevent you uploading a file that hasn't been secured. Those sort of things. So I'm going to try once more because I'm a glutton for punishment. We'll close that in case it's remembered the token. That's probably a good idea. There we go. So it's hit after probably two minutes. The conditional access policy has still been applied, but it doesn't enforce an MFA anymore. Or it has. It's been applied as a read uh, a report only. So if I go back to my portal here and I hit identity protection, here you can see part of this is a P2 feature, but it does show you Microsoft's investment in this stuff. So if I look at a sign in risk policy here, I can set all users, choose a sign in risk, so medium and above, and then require multi factor authentication. For a user risk, I can choose all users pick a user risk and require a password change. And I can enforce these policies across. I can also look at my risky sign-ins. So last one month. Uh, I've got a lot of risky sign-ins here. So I, um, I was in Buenos Aires, no I wasn't, I used a VPN. And because it was a new location, this was a risky sign-in. So you can go into this information, you can look at this user, you can see where he, he accessed, you can see what he was trying to access, and it says access has been blocked due to the conditional access policies. So even if it blocks it, it still treats it as a risk. Look at the risk detections in general over the last month. So I've got all those Buenos Aires ones, should have more than that, come on. So as an example, on the Microsoft tenant for Teams, I tried to sign in about two weeks ago and I'd had a failed authentication somewhere in the last hour or so. And that made Microsoft mark me as medium and guest users in Microsoft Teams for the Microsoft tenant can't sign in. So I had to go and remediate this user so I can now go into this risky user here. So conditional access is a risky user and I can see all these risky sign ins. And I can look at the risk detections that apply to him. They're all old, but I can make him reset his password. I can confirm he's was compromised because he's currently a medium risk. And I can turn around and go dismiss the risk. That drops the risk down. We've solved our problems there. So in conjunction with your Azure Active Directory, your Azure Active Directory identity protection and conditional access, I've got complete control over all of the 
methods of getting in, the applications I'm going to connect to, and whether or not I allow people to connect. OK. That's me done. There's a event feedback and a speaker feedback form there, which would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I do hope you have enjoyed it and I hope you carry on enjoying the last four or five hours. I think I've got about two minutes left and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. If 